So in terms of um, pragmatic dharma, this the reason that we're gathering here today, welcoming you to explore this with us, pragmatic dharma. What is this? Um, I'm going to talk about it very simply and very briefly here. And, and the first thing I wanted to say is that for me, it's been super helpful to think about pragmatic dharma as the coming together of these two ideas of pragmatism and dharma. And I'll have to acknowledge, I'm, although I am kind of interested in philosophy and kind of geeky on that front, uh, I never really read The Pragmatists. I just, and maybe this is a very pragmatic reason for it. I didn't feel like I needed to. It's like, what's this about? Oh, doing what works. Yeah, I get that. So why read about doing what works? Um, uh, so in that sense, uh, I, I will say I'm a pragmatic poser, uh, but uh, not, not in the sense that I, had, from the very beginning of my practice career, have really been interested in this question of like, well, what, what can I do that's actually going to work? Um, I don't want to waste my time. Uh, I don't want to fall into some kind of like magical cult situation where everyone's believing these absurd things and doing all these rituals and practices, you know, um, for, for no good reason. Um, for me, I've always been interested in finding out, uh, what practices will actually help alleviate some of this suffering, some of this difficulty of being a human being, um, being alive. Um, and I was very fortunate, uh, early on in my, in my practicing career to meet, uh, Kenneth, um, as a teacher. I met him through Daniel Ingram, who many of you may know, uh, author of Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. And um, Daniel at the time was, uh, he was in his early 30s and he was in med, med school. He was busy and he really wasn't really teaching a lot. So he said, hey, listen, I'm super busy, but I could pass you to a friend I know who really knows this stuff. He's the first person that I studied with. His name's Kenneth Folk. And so I was very lucky to start working with Kenneth. Uh, in 2005. And I think it was several years later that the term pragmatic Dharma arose in the community that we were both part of the Dharma overground that we'd helped start with Daniel. And um, for me, that, that phrase, once it arose and Kenneth identified it as the best possible way of describing the approach he was taking and that I was so interested in, it just made sense to me because on the one hand, we have this focus on doing what works, the pragmatic aspect of things. And then on the other side, we've got the Dharma. Um, and for me, it's really interesting to think about the bringing together these words because Dharma for some people, some of the time it can really sort of stand for like a bunch of ideals, spiritual ideals that we have, right? It's like perfect enlightenment, perfect skillfulness, completely upending greed, hatred, and delusion. There are a lot of very beautiful and also lofty ideals in, these, in this Buddhist Dharma tradition. Um, and so for me, the, the idea of bringing together and wedding pragmatism and Dharma of doing what works is really beautiful because it's like, it's like taking a pragmatic, idealistic approach where there's both that quality of wanting to find what actually is going to get us traction in practice in our lives. And also there's a sense of of not just falling into narrow view about what it is that's important to us and why we're doing this. There are a lot, for instance, of pragmatic entrepreneurs out there. I'm an entrepreneur myself, uh, so I think this is a cool thing to do. But a lot of folks, you know, get very pragmatic about building a company and they never stop to ask the question, well, why? Why am I doing this? You know, often it's to make money. Sure, we all have to do that. But, um, but sometimes people don't really stop and consider why they're really doing the things they're doing. So to have a little bit of idealism is also good. We don't wanna just be trying to do something that works and not have considered the ramifications of what it is that we're doing. Um, and Dharma, of course, is very interested in the question of how we live our lives, not just what we do in meditation, but how we actually are with each other and with ourselves. So today I want to talk a little bit about pragmatic dharma as doing what works and kind of expand out what that means. What does it mean to do what works in this context? The first question that arises for me here is doing what works for what? Again, why are we doing this or what are we doing it for? 
And here I think there's a really helpful model from the Buddhist wisdom traditions that we can bring in to help frame the kind of what, and that is the three trainings. So in early Buddhism, the Buddha would talk about three basic areas that we train in, in the context of Dharma practice. We train in morality or ethics. We train in concentration or what's sometimes translated as meditation. And we train in insight or wisdom. And these three domains or these three areas of practice, while they're not completely separable because they're all part of this one life, they can be distinguished as different domains of practice where there are different gold standards for what works. And there's different outcomes and different results that can be distinguished from each other. So doing what works in terms of ethics or morality, in terms of basically like living a good life and being a good person, um, which I'm sure you've heard this, or maybe you've even said this yourself before, like the whole point of this, right, is to be a kinder person, like to be a decent human being. And I think there's some very profound, deep truth about that. Like, what is the point of this if all you do is get really good at meditating and having deep, profound experiences if you get up off the cushion and begin to abuse people or take advantage of people, you know, um, and, and impact everyone around you in a negative way? It's, it's like, okay, yeah, actually that happens sometimes. That's why these things are, these trainings are, are differentiated. Um, because it is possible to be a highly enlightened sociopath, um, or to just be really immature in certain ways and not realize that the depth of our wisdom hasn't permeated our, our own activity in life. Suzuki Roshi, I remember had a great saying around this. He said, strictly speaking, there are no enlightened people, just enlightened activity. Um, some beautiful pointer. So doing what works when it comes to ethics can be quite varied, it's, right? It's like there's so many ways that we could get better at being a kinder human being. And part of pragmatic dharma includes looking at those questions. Well, yeah, what works? What actually works for us to be kinder? What actually works for us to have healthier relationships, um, to have healthier boundaries in our life with people that may be taking advantage of us or trying to harm us? Uh, what works? When it comes to being a good parent or being good at whatever roles we're in professionally, um, there are some things that the Dharma traditions have to offer here and that as practitioners, we can share with each other about what works when it comes to living a good life. And what works when it comes to meditation? Um, that's another question um, because there isn't just one kind of meditation, as I think we all know. There are many ways to meditate and many outcomes that can come from meditating. Um, in pragmatic dharma, there are some forms of meditation that we often highlight, um, things such as noting meditation or vipassana, uh, jhana practice, deep concentration, uh, metta, the brahma viharas, these kinds of practices. Um, and I think they're very helpful, but we don't have to stop at those practices, we can look also at other forms of meditative um, practice and see, well, what works? You know, maybe it doesn't work for you to use the breath as your concentration object. Maybe there's another object that would work. Maybe um, there's some type of technique that was invented outside the Buddhist tradition that could work for you. We don't necessarily have to be wed to a single tradition even with this approach. That's the pragmatic part of pragmatic dharma. If it works, then sure, let's include it. Let's actually see if it does the job. So there are many forms of meditation that could work, many techniques we could try. Um, and then what works in terms of developing wisdom or insight? Because we're, here it's interesting, make the distinction between meditation and wisdom. Um, just getting really good at getting into a state or getting good at accessing the jhanas by itself doesn't mean that we have deep wisdom or that we've awakened or that we're awake in this very moment. Um, it could just be that we're really good at getting into a state, which is great. Can, that can be useful for so many things, including living a good life, including with 
developing wisdom. Um, but wisdom comes, I'd say, on the one hand, in just one form. There is, in a, in a sense, a singular type of awakeness that's possible. And yet it can also take many forms, this awakened consciousness, this enlightened awareness. So I want to share this quote from Jack Kornfield in an article he wrote called Enlightenments, where he says, we know that the Buddha taught many different approaches to enlightenment, all as skillful means to release grasping of the limited sense of self and return to the inherent purity of consciousness. Similarly, we'll discover that the teachings on enlightened consciousness include many dimensions. When you actually experience consciousness free of identification with changing conditions, liberated from greed and hate, you find it multifaceted, like a mandala or a jewel, like a crystal with many sides. Through one facet, the enlightened heart shines as luminous clarity, through another as perfect peace, through another as boundless compassion. Consciousness, he says, is timeless, ever-present, completely empty, and full of all things. But when a teacher or tradition emphasizes only one of these qualities over the others, it's easy to be confused, as if true enlightenment can only be tasted in one way. Like the particle and wave nature of light, enlightened, enlightened consciousness is experienced in a myriad of beautiful ways. So pragmatic dharma, when we're looking at the question of what works to develop wisdom, I think we're exploring this paradox of the singular and multifaceted nature of awakening, that it, is, it appears to be both. It appears to be one thing that ex presents itself in all of these different ways. And so on the relative level of being a human being, uh, enlightenment is capable of endless enlargement, as it's said in the, in the uh, Japanese Zen tradition. And yet there is just one enlightened awareness. So what works? What works to develop wisdom across these different dimensions and what works to wake up right now in this very moment? Also, when I think about the question of doing what works, I think about, well, who is it that's doing it? Because we're not all the same. Yes, we all have the same basic biological hardware. We're all human beings. So there is some commonality in what works. We can't say everyone is completely different. Uh, and yet there are differences. And so doing what works also for whom? With pragmatic dharma, we are open to the question, again, of skillful means. What works for who? And one thing I've, I found very interesting, um, having practiced uh, social meditation, a, a technique and approach that Kenneth developed originally, it helped me to uh, extend my meditative awareness into relationship with other people. And what I realized in doing that uh, was that some people are more, have a tendency to be more self-focused and other people have a tendency to be more other focused. This was something that I guess I had known, but I hadn't really seen it in real time before until I started doing out loud meditation. And I started noticing, wow, like a minute just went by and I barely even registered what was going on for other people. Like I knew it was my turn. I kind of was keeping track a little bit, but I'm like super absorbed in what I'm going to say and what I'm experiencing. And wow, like, isn't that interesting? You know, here I am, I'm, I'm self-focused. I tend to be self-focused. Uh, while others tend to, to be other focused, they tend to lose themselves in others. While, also, while I and others will tend to lose uh, others in ourselves. And for me, doing what works uh, involves recognizing our personality and our tendencies, like how we tend to be and working with them. So for me, a lot of what works because I I'm tend to be self-focused is to focus on other people. It's to get off of myself. You know, it's, it's worked really well to be a parent, <laughs> uh, being a parent. You know, I didn't do this for me, of course, but do it, being a parent it works well to get your focus off yourself constantly. You just can't be focused on yourself as much when other people need you. Um, 
Um, doing what works for me has also meant, you know, focusing on uh, pro-social practices like heartfulness, like metta practices that are emphasizing wishing well to others. That's worked really well for me. Um, whereas someone who's more other focused might find practices where they are continually coming back to themselves and they're actually preferencing their own experience over others, that actually could work better for them. I remember Ken Wilber once quipped that um, in the Tibetan tradition, you, they have the practice of like doing 100,000 prostrations, where you keep just physically with your body, you just keep surrendering over and over, bowing, bowing. And he said, you know, for people that are more other focused, it, it would actually be better if you did 10, 100,000 stand ups, you know, where you stand up and assert your, your, your agency and your, your own authority and your own power. Um, that maybe that the opposite practice could be good for you. So with pragmatic Dharma, we recognize, well, depending on people's personalities, their tendencies, different things, or maybe even opposite things could work. There's not one way to do this. And then the last thing I want to mention here is, um, what works when, you know, when. When does it work to do something? We could also add where, where does it work to do it? Um, one of the things I've most appreciated learning from Kenneth and learning also in the Zen tradition is this idea of developing contemplative fluency. Like you become fluent in different languages. Like you could move, I have some friends that are, are uh, really interested in different, uh, learning different languages, Kenneth and Ryan, some other folks that are here really love languages. And I, I sort of admire that. I'm, I'm not particularly great at different languages. So I admire their ability to move in and out of different contexts and speak with different people uh, in their own language. There's this beautiful capacity to be, when you can move through different languages and be fluent in different ways, you can really meet the world where it is. And likewise with training and practice, with meditation, um, can we become fluent with our own experience at every level that it's happening, both at the, the very simple, basic sensory level of warmth, tingling, confusion, and even at the higher levels of abstract thought, of thinking, of analyzing, of comparing, of abstracting out into deep ideas. Can we be able to develop a fluency in which we can know at what level of experience it makes sense to operate right now. Can we, in the language of Zen, come up with an appropriate response? There's this famous Zen koan in which a Zen student asked to Yun Men, the Zen master, he says, what is the highest and most profound teaching of all the Buddhas, all the Buddhas throughout space and time? And Yun Men replies, an appropriate response. All the Buddhas are interested in how we're able to respond in this moment to what is, to being one with what is, to not being apart from it, and to, in all these ways that I've talked about in terms of our ethical orientation, in terms of our meditative awareness, in terms of our wisdom, fundamental wisdom to be able to appropriately respond. So for me, that's really ultimately what pragmatic is, Dharma is about. It's about this old Buddhist idea of skillful means of upaya. Ultimately, it's about figuring out how to respond to an unfolding and evolving reality, one that has this timeless dimension to it always already, and yet is constantly emerging forth as newly arising forms. And we're one of those forms. We are all part of that unfolding 